Hi, I changed this to things I'm finding out about the Cold War. Um, thoughts and opinions on, kind of sounds almost a little bit uh, high muck, demuck type stuff. It's just things I'm finding out that kind of shock me, I'm interested in. And today I'm going to talk about some, um, I, because I'm, my premise is what I'm reading and finding out is that the U.S. prolonged the Cold War. Um, we were dealing with somebody who could have fallen sooner. But the problem was, is that they had infiltrated our country, our government, academia, our culture, so that basically we, we, we were fighting a half-hearted effort because we were becoming the enemy. It was the old Pogo comic strip, we have met the enemy and they is us. So um, we're going to talk about some person. I'm going to talk about some personalities today that I think are important. We're talking about early 50s. Now I'll jump back to Truman's era. I'm in Eisenhower's era now, but there's some important things I think we need to kind of kind of think about. And just because I say this, I'm not going to cite books. I've read several books. I've got lots of books in front of me. Um, just kind of quote from them. Uh, talk about what I think I've seen. Put some things together. And uh, you don't have to agree with what I say, but as long as you're digging in and looking up yourself, trying to understand this stuff, it'd be good. So um, just Eisenhower, remember now Truman, President Truman had asked Eisenhower to run for president as a Democrat, but Eisenhower didn't agree with some things in the Truman administration. So he said he was going to become a Republican. He did before the the uh, 52 election. And um, his his uh, state secretary of state, John Foster Dulles, um, is was also an advocate of the New Deal, fair deal foreign policy, which they both uh, bought into. And uh, he served the State Department as an advisor and representative of international conferences from 45 to 52. More, and then Secretary Dulles um, was given responsibility for the elimination of communist influences from the State Department. But he had been a colleague, a patron, and had been kind of deceived by the traitor Alger Hiss. As chairman of the board of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, he had selected Hiss who resigned from the State Department under fire from Congress um, as president of the organization, Alice had a pretty good salary in those days of 20,000 a year. A Detroit lawyer wrote to Dulles offering to produce evidence that his had a provable communist record and Dulles contemptuously rejected the offer. Then there was Harold Stassen, who was a foreign operations administrator. He was in 1947 up to then, he was known as being further left than, you know, Wallace and Henry Wallace, um, he really advocated a 10-year a giveaway program of about 10% of our total production of goods and food um, and, and uh, as, as a, a social justice type of thing. And so it was pretty, he also manifested his capacity for global statementship, state, statesmanship at San Francisco on April 14, 1945. He was a member of the American delegation to the United Nations Charter Conference. Um, he, he, uh, you know, he was, he was very, very left wing um, for a Republican administration. James B. Gonet, a high commissioner to Germany, uh, he was a former president of Harvard. He was a zealous New Dealer. You know, New Deal. The New Deal was Roosevelt's socialist attempt to uh, overcome the depression, which did not. In fact, it created a, a depression. In a depression in 1937, it was only World War II that started to bring us out of it. Um, but he supported, Conant supported the communist-inspired Morgenthau plan to destroy Germany's industry, which would facilitate Soviet control of all Europe. Um, it, it had completely worked out. Then it was General, General Walter Bedell Smith, Under Secretary of State for Policymaking. He was a protege of General George C. Marshall, which we'll talk about more later. He's listed in our history as a a great leader, but there are some things, some problems, I think, with his pro-Soviet leanings. But um, but Smith was the secretary of the general staff when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, um, and and uh, when de decoded Japanese messages to talk, saying the immediate war reached the War Department on the night of December 6. Um, Smith was a colonel. He was urged by two other colonels to notify General Marshall immediately. He refused to notify General Marshall. The army chief, the chief of staff, and was reprimanded by an army board of inquiry, um, which found that the action by the War Department would have been sufficient to alert the Hawaiian command on the afternoon before the Japanese attack on the morning of December 7th. 
1941. So he's a, has his, his own checkered history. Walter S. Robertson, Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs. He was member of that China mission headed by General Marshall, we'll talk about uh, later, from the end of 45 to 47, which was inspired by communists and immeasurably aided the communist conquest of China. And that's according to a report by the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. He was in charge of the Peiping Executive Headquarters of the Marshall Mission, which sought to integrate 18 Chinese communist divisions into Chiang Kai-shek's army. If he saw anything wrong with this at the time, he didn't, he didn't express any opposition to it. Uh, Henry Byrode was the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern, South Asian, and South and African Affairs. He was a West Pointer. Uh, he was a Brigadier General during the war. He was another Marshall protege. He was operations officer at the Peiping Executive Headquarters of the Marshall China Mission. He became Assistant Secretary uh, for the Crucial Middle East, a major center of Soviet interest under Dean Atchison's regime in the State Department. And it was Charles Chip Bolin, ambassador to Moscow. Bolin was a career foreign service officer. He was a graduate of New Deal uh, diplomacy. He, he really bought into that whole socialist thing that Roosevelt had put in. He faithfully served President Roosevelt at Tehran and Yalta, and President Truman at Potsdam. Um, and when the Senate Foreign Relations Committee questioned him, he refused to repudiate the wartime sellouts to Stalin that we did to keep them in the war. Um, then there was Winthrop Aldrich, former board chairman of Chase National Bank. He was ambassador to Great Britain. He was an honorary knight of the British Empire. He was a real big Anglophile. Um, he was received his reward of the ambassadorship for his heavy financial support of Eisenhower's candidacy for president. And um, he, he apologized for us not getting involved in both world wars at the beginning when he talked in a... Um, Address. He addressed an English-speaking union in London on April 1st, 1953, um, and uh, he promised, made that statement, that the United States will be in the next war when it starts from the beginning. Um, very cheerful thought. Henry Cabot Lodge, he was the chief of the United States delegation to the United Nations. Uh, he was a New Deal internationalist. He was a globalist. He was defeated in the 52 election. Uh, before taking up his duties at the UN, he made a speech in French on UN radio, declaring that French soldiers in Indochina and Americans in Korea were fighting for the same purpose. Not exactly. Hundreds of millions of Asians thought, must have regarded this as confirmation of the communist charge that American imperialists were fighting to colonize Korea. We weren't trying to colonize Korea. We were defending it from an overtaking overthrow from communist forces. The French were trying to reestablish their their, their colonies, something that's ar ar archaic and, and the, the, the day of colonies had passed. Um, but it was known throughout Asia as well as France, the French and Indochina and Indochina were not fighting for altruistic reasons, but just to retain French colonial interests there. So we're going to go on to some of the policies that helped prolong the Cold War. But this is very, we, I thought this was very interesting. We have a, we have a president who, was a, who had been a Democrat till very recently. Um, and we have a lot of very left leaning people that he puts in his administration. And and these are sworn to fight communism. Um, so there's kind of a contradiction there. So this kind of explains some things that happen later on. So, you know, we'll, I'm going to continue talking about things that I find out about the Cold War that are interesting to me. I mean, they may not be interesting to you, um, but. It's it's just not the way I was taught. It was like when I was growing up, and I admit this was mostly when I was really young, it was a good guy, bad guy kind of thing. I mean, I saw the TV show um, when I was a little kid. I was a communist for the FBI. It was replayed, you know, long after it had been, it had been uh, canceled. It was replayed in New Jersey when I was in high school or just starting in high school. And you could watch it on a, on a channel there. And, you know, the idea was that we were we were staunch freedom lovers fighting um, the, the evil communist. And it wasn't quite that way. It's a lot more nuanced, a lot more complicated than that. Um, so we'll uh, we'll pick it up with some new things that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm finding out that I think are interesting. Um, and uh, we'll stop there. I hope you'll study the Cold War and uh, pick up some 
very interesting books. There's lots of interesting books on it. The closer to the time, the, like in the era, like if 40s get something written in the 40s because it's going to have fresh information in it. Now, a lot of these people guessed, guessed who was a Soviet agent or, or figured it out long before we had access to the Soviet archives to prove it. So very interesting stuff. I hope you'll enjoy studying yourself. Thank you.